the world's greatest mysteries of science and history. You're watching the MHS Network. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of MHS Network. My name is Coleman, and today we have a very special guest. His name is Ralph Sarchi. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Ralph Sarchi, Ralph Sarchi is an author. Uh, he wrote the book known as originally titled uh, Beware the Night, um, but some of you may know that book as being titled Deliver Us from Evil. Uh, big fan of the book, highly recommend it. We will provide links in the description uh, for that book where Ralph Sarchi details his experiences as a NYB, NYPD police sergeant as well as a religious demonologist. Um, Ralph, you also, correct me if I'm wrong, had the show, uh, three pilot episodes for the show Demon Files on Destination America. Um, you know, is there anything else I'm missing or you'd like me to throw in there, Ralph, um, in regards to your work or, or anything that I'm, I'm missing at all? Uh, hi, Coleman. No, you know, you, you pretty much uh, uh, hit all the major points. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, Ralph, uh, I was thinking about, you know, how to kind of start off this conversation, this interview with you, and I feel like really one of the best ways and the only way to really start a conversation like this, um, when I read your book, I know you kind of, and like I said, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know you kind of title what you do with, you know, the demonology and helping those who are afflicted by the demonic and demonic activity, whether it be oppression or possession or whatever the case may be you know you kind of refer to it as the work um how did you get involved in the work how did that process begin well actually um years ago uh in my younger days i had uh i had worked with ed and lorraine warren from connecticut and uh it was actually the warrens that coined the phrase the work um, and, uh, you know, being that I was in it, I, uh, I, uh, took that also and would call it the work myself. So that just, uh, you know, I, that just stuck. Uh, it, it was just a way to describe, you know, um, what we were involved in. Gotcha. And could you explain, and that's another thing I, you know, I wanted to ask you, what was it like working with the Warrens? Cause I know, you know, right now, Hollywood, you know, the big movies right now is the whole Conjuring universe, which is based off, you know, some of the cases and the investigations of the Warrens. I know um, Conjuring 3, which is based off the Devil Made Me Do It case is coming out here soon. They just released the trailer for that. Um, but obviously, those are some pretty big, popular horror movies. Um, what was it like working with the Warrens? And what is it like, you know, seeing these films? I don't know if you, if you have seen them. But, you know, what's it like, you know, knowing that these movies based off the Warrens, you know, knowing how popular they are, um, how, you know, accurate are those films in any way based off your knowledge and, and just in general, what was it like working with with the Warrens? Well, I hate to disappoint you, but I, I really don't watch those movies. Um, I haven't seen, uh, you know, a, a, any of the uh, the Warren movies. I, I just I just don't watch them. I don't find them entertaining. Um, and you have to realize that uh, there's a lot of Hollywood hype that goes into makings of these movies. My movie, Deliver Us From Evil, included. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm really not into the genre as far as, as that's concerned. Um, I was reading about the Warren since I was a little kid. And, uh, you know... Um, about eight, nine, ten, around that age, I started to gain an interest. Um, and it started out basically with the, uh, the unidentified flying object phenomenon, which I now know is a demonic deception. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would read a lot of books on the subject. And the Warrens kept coming up in a lot of my readings. So it was years later uh, when I was I actually got married and had my uh, my first child that I uh, had gone into a, a bookstore while shopping for for uh, baby clothes for my uh, new one month old daughter 
And um, I, I don't walk by bookstores. I go. I have to go in. And I have to see what's going on, and I have to see what new books are out. And um, it was actually my ex-wife who came up to me and put a book called Satan's Harvest in my hands. And she said it's it's those. It was written by those people that you talk about a lot. So I I purchased the book, of course, and I read it. And that was the book that sort of um, sparked my interest to actually contact the Warrens. And I, and I did, I did do that. And uh, I became uh, one of their investigators very, very soon after that initial contact. What is a specific case, um, if you can recall one specifically that sticks out to you that you, um, and I guess what I'm trying to, trying to ask is, is there a case that you investigated with the Warrens that specifically stuck out to you in regards to pretty much any criteria, you know, in regards to the level of activity or the severity of the case? Um, you know, is there any specific case that you did with the Warrens that, that sticks out in your mind even to this day? Well, I, I would have to say that um, most of them were pretty severe. As, as far as diabolical activity is concerned. And, and mind you, um, I, I lived in New York at the time, and they were in Connecticut. So in order for me to go all the way up to Connecticut uh, to handle a case, you know, it was usually something that was pretty involved. Um, but I predominantly um, worked on cases of demonic possession. I didn't investigate many cases of infestations and oppression cases, even though, you know, th th there were a lot of them. I predominantly um, dealt with the uh, assisting Bishop McKenna in uh, in the exorcisms. And, uh, you know, uh, all of them were pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Mm. Um, man, there's so many questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, and I'm trying to kind of keep it in line with, you know, the train of thought that we're currently on. So I apologize if I jump kind of all over the place, but don't, don't worry about that. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, though, is are you still involved in the work? Yes, I'm still involved in the work. Yeah. OK. But on a lesser scale, I, um, I do more consulting now. Um, I have some investigators that are out there actually uh, investigating the cases like Sean, uh, Sean Austin mm -hmm. is one of my investigators. And, you know, he's uh, he in his own right, he is a, uh, a, a very good investigator. Um, I'm, I reserve more of my time, like I said, towards uh, consultations and and teaching classes. That's mm -hmm. predominantly what I do now. Gotcha. Um, so you kind of brought up earlier, and I, and I think that's an interesting kind of leeway for the next question I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, you kind of brought up how UFO activity was something that kind of uh, got you initially sort of interested in the, the unexplained um, paranormal, if you'd like to call it that. Um, and but now you kind of realize and I'm with you on that as well me personally and, and that's something I've always wanted to talk about was kind of the demonic nature of a lot of the alien quote-unquote phenomena the UFO phenomena um, and that's something as, as well when, when regards to something that appears to be something other than demonic but in actuality is demonic and like I said this is just my leeway because I was want to ask you specifically a case that stuck out to me that you talked about in your book um, where you talk about, and, I've, and like I said, you might have to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going based off the memory bank here, but when I was reading your book, a case that stuck out to me that you talked about was the case of, I believe it was this, this family that um, was having encounters with, I believe, a supposed female spirit that was claiming to have been killed and her body dumped in the swamp near their house and was encouraging communication between the family and the spirit and end up being a demonic spirit. Um, how often do you think, you know, how, how common is that, you know, with, with spirit, with the demonic mimicking the spirits of, of human souls and, and trying to gain the trust of the families or the individuals that they're trying to afflict? How common is that, would you say? Well, I would have to say uh, we're looking at uh, at least 90% of the cases 
Um, in a case of infestation, the demonic will mimic uh, the spirit of a human being because what they're not trying to frighten at this particular point, what they're trying to do is they're trying to ingratiate themselves with the family and get the family very interested in the story that the spirit relates, whether it's through um, interior locution, meaning people are hearing voices in their heads, or if the spirit is actually manifesting itself and they, they're they not going to manifest themselves, you know, as their uh, true nature because they don't want to frighten people at that particular time. They need to gain a foothold. And usually they're going to operate on people's compassion, on people's humility. And once they get themselves ingratiated with the family, then they slowly will start to, um, you know, bring about phenomenon that's frightening. And they'll use the, the they'll use the guys actually that there are bad spirits here also when in fact it's uh, you know there there are no good spirits there at all mm -hmm. it's it's a con game actually and you know there are different types of uh, demonic spirits as far as their nature and their power because of the um, nine choirs of angelic spirits mm -hmm. which is where they come from. Right. They were once angelic spirits. Gotcha. Um, so I guess the next question to ask would be, you know, how does one, well, let me preface that with saying, so do you believe that human souls can in fact be earthbound, can in fact haunt a location? Um, is that at all possible? Well, that is a difficult question to uh to actually answer as well as prove mm -hmm. and, and i never really believed much in the human spirit phenomenon um i thought that the human spirit phenomenon was extremely rare and it is <clears throat> but i know it does exist because one of my methods father malik martin mm -hmm. um, had said that uh he had experience with a human spirit over the years, uh, you know, I, I did know that the human spirit phenomenon could come about, but not as much as, you know, we were seeing. And I would have to say that uh, a, a very, very um, high percentage of cases are demonic in nature. Mm -hmm. Human spirits are very, very um, weak in the spirit world. Um, we as human beings cannot manipulate the natural order that God instituted mm -hmm. while we're alive in physical form. That's why I think this global warming stuff is a crock <laughs> because we, we cannot interfere with, with the natural order that God instituted on this earth. Now the demonic, on the other hand, they can manipulate the natural order that God instituted while operating outside of it. Uh, and, and I hope that's, that's, I made that pretty clear. Um, so over the course of years that I've been studying this subject, now I never used scientific methods, um, you know, back in the day. And actually there weren't any. Uh, but with the advent of the um, equipment, uh, spirit boxes and REM pods and uh, things of that nature. Back in the day, all we had were, uh, we would use instamatic cameras because you could not doctor an instant photo. Right. The only problem with that is without the net to a photo, we could, you know, we can't be sure with what we're dealing with because if you were using a regular film camera that you needed to develop, Whatever, if, if you had something on a photo and it wasn't on the, uh, the negative, we would suspect it as debunking, you know, that we would debunk it. But if it showed up on the negative, then we knew that the camera lens, that the speed of the camera actually did pick up some type of energy. And, of course, we used tape recorders. 
but I wasn't really big in, in the, the uh, paranormal aspect. Um, I was investigating cases in a religious vein from a religious point of view. Mm-hmm. Not that the church discounts science. That's, that's a fallacy if anybody believes that. The church is very, very much into science. And in fact, there are a lot of scientific um, things that have come out over the years that I believe actually go for the proof for the existence of God mm-hmm. and, and the spirit world. So, you know, I sort of narrowed things down after a while and felt that whenever we were dealing with uh, any kind of human spirit phenomenon, we would be looking more along the lines of a purgatorial spirit. Right. Um, Because in the Bible, it says life, death, judgment, heaven, hell. It does not have a category for anything other than you live, you die, you get judged, and you go one or the other place. But we cannot discount the fact of a purgatory Mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church. We believe very strongly in this place uh, called purgatory. And I believe that there are three levels of purgatory. Mm -hmm. And the third level is where I believe that human spirit activity comes from. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to measure spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, um, they don't manifest, sit down with you and have a cup of coffee or a shot of whiskey and <laughs> tell you all their problems. You right. know, it, doesn't op- it doesn't work like that. They don't operate like that. So, right. you know, over the course of the years with the studies and, you know, um, you would test things by scripture mm-hmm. and things of that nature. You could sort of, you know, come close to what we might be dealing with, but nobody really knows. And I don't think anybody will ever really know, you know, um, why we're still here on this earth. Mm-hmm. So how, how important is, because you kind of brought that up, and I would like to explore that a little bit more, because I think that's a really excellent point, is... Because I feel like with a lot of people, a lot of investigators, you know, for them, the the concept of faith and approaching this subject and the subject of the paranormal, the demonic, you know, it's oftentimes not done through the lens of faith or the lens of, you know, a Christian worldview. And like you kind of brought up comparing things to the scriptures, for example, uh, to try to make sense of the paranormal phenomena that we experience do you think that's something that kind of gets left out by a lot of investigators is just they, they don't keep in mind, you know, the appropriate religious viewpoints that they need to keep in mind when doing these investigations? Do you think that it just gets completely, you know, um, just left behind and completely forgotten? Or, you know, how important is faith and, and religion when doing these investigations? Well, I, I absolutely agree with you. And the way I feel about it is this. Um, We are told, actually, in Scripture, not to communicate with the dead, Mm -hmm. not to communicate with spirit. Um, In in the sense of, um, you know, gaining something from it. Right. You know, uh, like uh, manipulating the spirit well for personal gain. I believe that if your motives are pure and you desire to help people, I believe that even though we might be dealing with uh, the spirit world, you know, um, the motive is to help people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've always felt uncomfortable with that aspect, you know, of investigations, even during the demon files when I was using all of those somebody's text of course oh no you're fine um, you're fine can you did you just hear that no i didn't hear anything okay good um uh, 
Well, so I apologize. <laughs> you're good. Um, you're good. It's no issue whatsoever. This is all pre-recorded. Back on track there, but I'm sorry. No, you're good. You're good. You're 100 fine. It's no big deal. Oh, uh, yeah, no, you're. I, I, I don't remember what I was saying. <laughs> no, you're, <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, you were talking. We were kind of just talking about like the importance of you know having a Christian worldview right, right. And, with investigation yes. um, and everything. So, I, you know, I do believe that uh, if you're going to be involved in this field, I believe that your motives must be pure um, in order to make sure that the demonic, um, you know, are not going to take retribution on you and your family. Mm -hmm. And you will not have that protections that God affords. You know, you, if you're operating outside of the church, and you're doing this, you're, you're on dangerous ground because who's going to protect you? Right. And that's why I have a, a very big problem with, um, uh, you know, what I'm seeing these days in this day and age. Because back when I first started in the field, nobody was doing this, this work. You know, nobody even talked about this subject uh, Anybody who would uh, reach out to me uh, for help always asked for confidentiality. And I always gave confidentiality till this day. I will not reveal the identities uh, of the people, you know, that I, that seek my, uh, my help. Mm -hmm. And it sort of pains me when I see people running around abandoned buildings, you know, um, communicating with spirits and actually not having a clue as to who or what they're actually communicating with. Right. There is a danger in doing this that if you go into a location, an abandoned building, and you start to communicate with a spirit and all the spirit starts to communicate with you, that there's a good chance that it's going to follow you home. Yeah. And now you, uh, you've you just gone to a place that that you investigated because, what well, it's fun. I get it. I understand. It, it It is fun to a certain degree, especially in abandoned, in abandoned buildings because there's, you know, there's nobody suffering connected with it except for possibly um, a human spirit that might be um, – earthbound at that location but then again they're very limited as to how they can communicate and the manipulation of the physical environment is practically nil mm -hmm. there's no physical assaults there's no possessions there's no moving around of heavy objects by a human spirit if you have a heavy object moving around that's a demon doing that that's not a ghost right so now you've you've got this spirit that you've opened the line of communication with and now you go home and you have little children at home and now you start to have an infestation or an oppression going on and most people don't understand where it's coming from why yeah. is this happening i get tons tons of messages from people that have that particular uh situation going on in their homes right is there how important is the sacraments such as because whenever i research this and i research you know spiritual warfare and battling against the demonic it seems that you know one of the, the biggest things that's emphasized by a lot of people who deal with this this subject and, and this type of um these type of cases is they always emphasize the importance of the sacraments, the Eucharist, confession, absolution. Um, how important is that? Is there, you know, whether that comes from a personal experience you have in mind or like a personal case where you've seen that, you know, personally help someone or maybe someone neglecting to do that, which then caused them in turn to be afflicted. Um, how important is receiving the sacraments in regards to spiritual protection? And, and doing uh, engaging in spiritual warfare with the demonic. How important is that, Ralph? Well, you, you'd be a moron if you entered into this work and were not 
uh, you know, taking advantage of the sacraments and the sacramentals of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, prayer, holy water, blessed salt, blessed incense, blessed oil. Um, you know, all of these things, the prayers of exorcisms themselves, the relic of the true cross or a relic of the saint. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all things that need to be utilized in the proper manner. Um, you know, more so for demonic possession cases, because those there isn't anything like a demonic possession case. You can you can have uh, an Amityville style haunting and multiply that by a thousand. And that still will not come near an actual demonic possession case or the right of exorcism. You need to, you cannot battle the devil on his own ground. And unless you're in a state of grace, meaning that you've gone to confession, you've um, received absolution, you've done the prescribed penance that the priest gives you. Mm -hmm. You need to receive the Holy Eucharist in order to receive eternal salvation. Remember in scripture, Jesus says, unless you eat of the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, there'll be no life in you. Right. How can you not abide by the commandments of God and go up against the devil? Because if you're not abiding by the commandments of God, by default... You belong to the devil. Your soul belongs to the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. We're all sinners. You know, we, we have a fallen nature. Human beings have a fallen nature. We're the only creation of God that has that. The animals don't have it. Plants don't have it. But human beings, the human soul, has it. And you need to exercise the, you know, the, um, the commandments of God. You need to actually put them into work in your life. Or you'd be absolutely insane to go up against demonic. I would never do it. Right. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'll give you an example. I don't want to badmouth anyone. But you see these, you see these programs on TV, right? Right. Where the uh, the investigators challenge the spirit. And what happens? They get assaulted. Right. Yeah. But when you've seen the demon files, I challenge the devil. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, very hard I challenge the devil with religious provocation. Mm -hmm. You didn't see any scratches or biting on me. You need that protection. Right. And the only way you get it is by following the commandments of God and being in a state of grace as much as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. When you fall, you get to confession as soon as possible, <clears throat> confess your sins, and get back into the right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. But you really do need to lead a certain type of life, style, actually. If you're going to be effective in this field, um, the only way you're going to be a threat against the demonic is if you are following the commandments of God as closely as you could possibly follow them. Mm. Like I said, we, we have a fallen nature. God understands us. He made us like this for a reason. Mm -hmm. It was going to be easy. Right. No, yeah. I, and I think those are all really excellent points. And I'm glad you really kind of spoke up about that because I've always, you know, wondered, I mean, and I guess this is maybe kind of a part two to that question. You know, if when you have, I'm sure, and I think you kind of discussed this in your book um, in regards to like when Protestants want to participate in helping out with, let's say, an exorcism or an investigation where there's a family or an individual being afflicted in some way. Um, what does that really look like for, you know, let's say a Protestant who kind of rejects the idea of the sacraments and sacramentals and the importance of those things and are missing a, a big, huge, important chunk of, of the Christian faith, right? You know, the Eucharist and confession. Um, 
you know, do you think that they're missing out on that protection? And is that something you've seen firsthand? Well, not not exactly. My my experience has been the exact opposite. Oh, because wow. I was friends with M. Scott Peck. I don't know if you if you know who he is. Uh, hopefully, some of your audience listeners will will uh, know who M. Scott Peck is. But he was he was a, a he was well, he's dead now. He was a Protestant who was a uh, psychiatrist. He wrote Children of the Lies that might spark, uh, you know, you know, spark you know and who he is. Mm-hmm. And um, he was successful in his deliverance ministry. And Protestants don't do exorcisms. They do deliverances. They're very different, actually, um, uh, exorcisms uh, compared to deliverances. Uh, Exorcisms are more of a command by the priest, by the exorcist. Protestants usually utilize uh, intercessory prayers but some of them, like uh, uh, Carl Lawson, who I don't ascribe to, uh, will will use more of a command style. Uh, you know, in his deliverances, he doesn't do exorcisms. He's not a priest. I don't know why he's wearing the collar. But you know, um, there's a lot of people out there that are doing uh, that doing things that they really shouldn't be doing. But you know, therefore, by the grace of God, go I. They, you know, God's going to afford His protections to people who have pure motives right. at heart, even though they might not be, you know, uh, doing what God commands them to do, their motives are still pure and they're doing it out of Christian charity, mm-hmm. which is very, very important uh, to us. Uh, the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. While we're on the earth, we need faith and we need hope. But when we die, if we obtain heaven, we don't need faith anymore. We don't need hope, but we still need Christian charity. That's one of the theological virtues that will remain with us, um, you know, in heaven. Mm-hmm. So as as long as it's being, uh, you know, the the investigation, the exorcism, the deliverance, whatever it is, is done in that spirit of Christian charity. God will uh, afford protections, but still, I would not gamble. I would not want to gamble, you know, getting involved from that point of view or that that belief system mm-hmm. uh, to find out that, oh, geez, I was wrong, you know, um, and, and now I'm, I'm catching a hurt. Right. You know, and... Um, Over the years, I, I really, in my own life, never really experienced um, demonic activity outside of a case. Every now and then, I would experience it for certain reasons, but it was my family that experienced it more than I did. Right. So you always have to keep that in the back of your mind that, you know, um, you got to be careful when you get involved in the spirit world for whatever reasons you're doing it whether it's for good reasons or bad reasons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's not something that really should be done uh, because you have a curiosity or you consider it a hobby. It's If you're going to do it right, it has to be a calling. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, no, definitely. Like I said, those are really, I think, really solid clarifications. And I, it's, it's good to hear you know, you talk about the importance of spiritual protection, right, via the sacrament, sacramentals, and and just, um, you know, just in general coming at this from a, from a religious worldview, and and most part, obviously, a Christian worldview, more importantly. Um, You kind of brought up the demon files, and I was wanting to ask you about that. How did that show come about? Um, You know, how, how did that happen? Oh, you know, um, there are a lot of strange things that take place in life. Right. You know, and I don't understand a lot of that. But I was contacted by a gentleman from from the UK mm-hmm. who was a producer for um, the Discovery Channel. And they wanted to do, 
they, they wanted to do a show on on the supernatural, the preternatural. And this uh, this gentleman had called me, and I I I had already turned down the Discovery Channel about two times before this. I think I believe I've turned down every single major network over the over the years. Uh, you know, um, as far as doing a show is concerned, because they did not want me to do things from a religious point of view. Mm-hmm. And it was it was actually I, I did a, a sizzle reel for the Discovery Channel, and a couple weeks later, the gentleman called me back and says, "No, they they, they don't want to go uh, in that direction." So I'm like, I figured, you know, um, I, I could have told you that before we even did this. But what he did is he contacted a man named Eddie Bellini, who's here in the United States. He's in California, and he's he's also a producer. And he contacted me, and um, to make a very 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 long story short, um, you know, I wound up uh, doing the three episodes or the three cases for Destination America, which is a sister company of Discovery. Right. So you know, I was like, wait a minute, I Discovery. Uh, about six months ago said that they didn't want to approach it from this point of view and now now you said okay I, you know people buy buy oh schizophrenic what well, you know <laughs> what's your problem it wasn't good then now it's good now so right. but that's the way it worked out and, and and ultimately the network didn't want to continue because of the extreme religious nature of the program i see i had no idea that was the reason why because i I thought the show was great when it first came out and obviously I was younger then and I wasn't as familiar with, you know, you, you personally and your connections with, you know, Father Father Martin and, and the Warrens and everything is before I read your book. But I remember watching that when I was younger and I loved the show and that's that's insane to me. So they so they refuse to continue on with the show because of the explicit religious connections. Well, there were more reasons than that. I mean, you know, um, I basically didn't really want to do the show. Okay. Um, and I actually told him I'm not doing it. And uh, Eddie Bellini had sort of talked me into uh, to hanging in there just a little longer. And then it, it actually did happen. But I, I told the Discovery Channel to take a long walk off of a short pier. <laughs> the problem is, is that the networks don't like to deal with people who they can't control. Right. Because there was... Uh, you know, I, I actually, within the contract, I said, I want editorial control of this show. And uh, Discovery said, well, yeah, we'll give you that, but we do have the final say because we're paying for the product. And I said, okay, but it's virtually unheard of, you know, where you would have, uh, you know, the people involved in the show, the cast would actually have any kind of say over the editorial process. And, um, you know, I just wanted everything to be 100% truthful and no game playing, right. you know, nothing scripted, none of that stuff. So, you know, I go back and forth with um, with the network and, and I did get my way that way. I'm very forceful when I want something done, especially when it comes to the work. You know, I'm very serious about this. This is not a hobby or a game for me. Right. So it was very important that, you know, um, it was done properly. Absolutely. So I, I, I guess that they felt that, you know, uh, the networks like to have control over people, at least in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have that with me and they knew it. So that was probably a, a, one of the things. And sometimes I'm a nasty SOB. So that <laughs> probably played into it also. <laughs> No, I uh, believe it or not, I'm very nasty sometimes, uh, Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that's more than than fair. I mean, it's you know, for you to, and it's a shame, obviously, that the networks are like that, where you know, it, it's got to be made to such a big deal to where you just want the show to be be true and honest, and then and, and to avoid the scripted, you know, BS. I think that's, I th- I think that's more than fair, and that's how it should be. But unfortunately, that's that's not the case. Um, would you ever revisit if, if the right network and the right circumstances and conditions, right? You know, they let you have the creative control that you would want and need. Probably not. No, no, probably not. Right. I don't have, um, you know, 
I don't have the drive. That's that's a young man's game. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of work that goes into that, you know. Um, and at this particular stage in the game, you know, my my flaps are down. I'm coming in for a landing. I'm looking to retire. I'm looking to decrease myself in this field and let the young guys out there. You right. know, um, I've trained i trained quite a few people. Let them go out there and do this now. I'm I'm sort of, you know, just looking for the teaching aspect, the consultations. Uh, you know, I've been involved in this field almost 40 years and, and, uh, you know, you do get tired of it. And uh, I really seriously doubt that I would do anything uh, of that nature again. But then again, I, I don't know what God has planned for me and I'm not ambitious in this field. I, I don't go out and try to get these things to happen. I wait for them to come to me. And that's the way I've been doing this right from the beginning. When before I even wrote the book, I, I didn't bring this to uh, you know to St. Martin's Press. Uh, I had uh, had people come to me and say, "Do you want to write this?" And I've always resisted. And I said, "No, I don't want to write a book." Right. But you know, um, I listened to what people say. Some people were very good at what they did, and. You know, I went along with the program and it's sort of, uh, you know, everything came about from it. But um, I, I'm not ambitious when it comes to this. I let God lead me where he wants me to go. I don't I don't lead God to where I want to go. You know, that's just the way it is. Right. Um, so is there anything for you now? Because I, I think that's that's an interesting point, right? Is that, you know, this is not something you necessarily pursue but it's it just when if something's brought to you and and if you believe that's where god wants you to go then that's where you go um is there a certain area is, is there a certain subject that you feel god is really is pushing you forward in in regards to you know kind of what you talk about what you what you focus on or is it still generally the work or you know what what is it now do you believe that god is really wanting you to to push forward in well, it's my faith Mm-hmm. And there is no doubt about that. You know, um, if I never assist in another exorcism again or deal with another case, um, that's fine by me. It's it is my faith. Um, you know, there there is no doubt about that. Uh, you know, the I, I look at things as far as when I first started out in the work to to where I am at this present day right now, as far as my faith is concerned, and it. It was more important for me to learn more about God than the devil, actually. I don't think about the devil. I don't think about demons. I think about God. I think about the Blessed Mother. Mm-hmm. I think about uh, my faith. That's that's what, you know, was predominantly uh, um, rules my life. But not the devil, not the work, not demonology, not any of that. That's, you know... That, that's it, it just happens to be a byproduct of my faith what i'm more concerned about these days is um trying to get people to understand how important it is to uh to have a relationship with god in 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 the traditional catholic church now um you know i want people to 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 save their souls. That's that's my that's my main goal. That's what's in the forefront of my mind. Is if I can if I can inspire somebody to um, either get a relationship with God or rekindle that relationship with God, mm-hmm. get into a state of grace, go to mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation, and just start to listen to what God wants, and that's to love God and love one another. I don't see a whole lot of love going on in this world these days. And, you know, um, having Father Malachi Martin as one of my mentors, uh, you know, he has definitely given me the information or at least some of the information that I need in order to navigate the world that we're living in today mm-hmm. as far as being a, uh, a Catholic Right. You know, um, 
I'm a, a white heterosexual uh, male Catholic, which is frowned upon by a large segment of this society. Um, and I only too well know what the situation, you know, that we're living in these days, in this present day, what the ramifications of that is. And it's frightening. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's disturbing. And, uh, you know, I just try not to live a life of despair. I try to uh, live my life that God's in control and it is God's will uh, and not anyone else's will, um, you know, with what's going on in this world. Right. Um, so I, I, we're kind of reaching that hour mark. And so I feel like this subject is, is extremely important. And I, I love that you bring up how, you know, it, it's, it's the importance of focusing on God and not, not the devil. And I, to me personally, like I said, this is my personal opinion. And to me personally, you know, I have to watch myself as well because, you know, I do, I am interested in researching the paranormal. I, I do like to read about it. I like to research it, obviously make videos about it. Um, and it is interesting. It is extremely interesting. But at the same time, I do think that if we're not careful, obviously, you know, unhealthy interests and obsessions can develop. And, and if you're focusing so much of your time on the devil, the demonic, right, and not, you know, the things that are holy, the things that are of God, then your focus is on, on the wrong thing. So um, thank you for talking about that, Ralph. I think that's extremely important. Um, I just lastly, like I said, as we approach that hour mark, um, is there anything you want to say? If you, if there's anything that that you just feel is the most important to get out there right now, in regards to the current context that we're in, in regards to the current condition of the world, you know, obviously I know that's a pretty heavy question there. Um, but if if there's just one last thing, right, you know, at the end of this interview, that you just feel is the most important for people to look at and take notice of. Uh, you know, what would that be? What, what would you like for people to know? I would like people to know that if they are not actively, actively seeking God, if they're not actively living his commands, then you by default belong to the devil. You might not be a bad person. You might not even realize it. You know, a lot of people, they get up, they go to work, they come home, they're family people, and they have absolutely no time for God whatsoever. You know, and Sunday morning rolls around and people say, you know, it's my only day to sleep in. I'm, I'm not getting up and going to church. I'm not going to mass. Well, that's fine. As long as you know that at the moment that you draw your last breath, you have chances of obtaining heaven have been lost for all eternity and it's it's a horrible feeling um that you'll have when you make that realization and god does not promise anyone a next breath you don't know when your life is going to end here on this earth um but when it does whatever you've done here or whatever you've neglected to do here, that's it. Mm -hmm. It cannot be changed. And when the gates of hell close behind you and the realization sets into your soul that you will never, ever for all eternity come out of those gates again, well, um, that's something that I wouldn't want to fathom for myself. And I very, very strongly feel that way that I wouldn't want another human being, no matter how bad they are, to experience something like that. Mm. You can always go back to God, no matter how bad you've been, no matter what you've done. It does not matter. You go back, you say, I want to be forgiven. I'm sorry. Really, really mean it. And you all have to go through that scenario that I just described to you. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I really, I, th I think that's really the perfect way to end this conversation here. Um, I couldn't word that any better myself, but um, just to reiterate and not to sound redundant, but just to reiterate it, I guess, in my own words and really drive that in, um, you know, like Ralph said, the, the importance and recognizing the importance of the fact that there's a part of us that's eternal, that lives on forever. And the importance of recognizing um, that ultimately there's two locations, right, for our souls. And that's either, you know, in union with Christ and, and with God in heaven forever or, um, or in hell. And, and just recognizing the reality of that and the importance of, like Ralph, like you just said, of, of repentance and turning to Christ and turning to God in repentance um, for the forgiveness of our sins, right? So um, obviously that's, that's of the utmost importance and that really is the most important message that you could ever give anyone, um, you know? So, uh, so thank you, Ralph, so much for that. And thank you um, as we approach that hour mark um, for your time. Thank you so much for for sure. giving you. you absolutely and giving your knowledge and and, and uh, your experiences. Um, it truly means the world. Um, for the viewers at home, is there any social media or or, or anything that you would like to uh, have us point the viewers um, who are watching this video, maybe to your Facebook or, or is there any other social media plugs? That's, that's pretty much it. That's all I have is for now. Right. Uh, there's a Facebook page. But you know how precarious the situation is with Facebook as far as the content that, uh, you know, that they want to allow on on my page. They've never bothered me for any of my religious, uh, you know, posts. Mm -hmm. But um, I've had experiences when it comes to political uh, posts where the problem lies. But right now... Um, Facebook is pretty much the only social media. Um, I, I don't have Twitter anymore. I got rid of that. Mm. Um, the only thing I have, like I said, is Facebook. So if anybody needs to get in contact with me, you can find me there. Gotcha. Well, we'll um, if it's cool with you, you know, we'll put links in the description uh, to your Facebook. So people who want to follow you and keep sure. up with you and, um, you know, get in contact with you if necessary, you know, can do that. Um, sure. so once again, Ralph, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and conclude this video. Uh, thank you for watching everyone. Please like comment and subscribe. If you like what we do here, um, like I said, check out the link in the description box for Ralph Sarchi's material and, uh, we will see you guys next time. Peace out.